You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In 1894, a strike against the Pullman Railroad Car Company soon blossomed into a wider work stoppage by railroad workers that nearly paralyzed the nation's rail system. President Grover Cleveland responded by sending in federal troops to break the strike, a move that led to the deaths of over 100 workers. Eight years later, President Theodore Roosevelt faced a similar strike, this time by coal miners, that threatened to paralyze the national economy. But Roosevelt, unlike Cleveland, rejected calls to use the military, and instead called the mine owners and the mine union leaders to the White House, where they worked out a compromise that ended the strike. These contrasting examples revealed that in the history of the struggles between workers and employers, the role of the government often played a decisive role in the outcome. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History is about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 166, a special Labor Day episode in which we examine the long history of workers, unions, and strikes in American history. We are brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and come to you this week from the Big Bill Haywood Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. The benevolent foreman of this operation is executive producer Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, Labor Day is upon us, so I'm up to my years in work getting ready for the start of the semester. Our classes begin on September 4th, so it's basically crunch time. But to be honest, it's also a fun and exciting time. As a new first-year class arrives and our veteran students return another year older and hopefully another year wiser. In other news, We have a new top-selling t-shirt at In the Past Lane. It says in a very cool font, Huzzah! Another popular new shirt says, Well-behaved women seldom make history. And another one that features the African proverb, Until lions have their historians, Tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. And of course, we've got some snarky stuff, like a t-shirt that reads, Dear America, Okay, I'm begging you, Stop repeating this shit. Sincerely, History. And remember, all these items, and many, many more, are available as t-shirts, but also as hoodies, mugs, cell phone cases, baby onesies, wall prints, stickers, and more. So check it all out at inthepastlane.com. Just click on Merchandise. Thanks. Finally, on Saturday, September 7th, I'm doing a 100-mile bike ride to raise funds for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. It's the 12th annual New England Parkinson's Ride, and my goal is to raise $2,500. I've got several people in my family with Parkinson's, so it's a cause near and dear to my heart. So if any of you would like to help out, look for my postings about my fundraising page on social media, or just send me an email or a direct message, and I'll send you the link. Thanks. Okay, people, let's keep this picket line moving. Your journey in the past lane begins now. The annual Labor Day holiday is often marked by last trips to the beach and backyard barbecues. But Labor Day was established by workers way back in 1882 to draw attention to three things. One, the essential role of workers in creating all the nation's wealth and abundance. Two, that American workers face constant threats to their well-being by abusive and greedy employers who force them to work long hours for inadequate pay. And three, that if workers succumbed to this oppression, America would cease to be a democracy and over time would gradually resemble an old-world society ruled by a small aristocracy. 
These concerns about fairness, justice, equality, and dignity in the workplace are very much alive in 2019. So, as we debate issues like the $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, Social Security, corporate taxation, automation and robots, and so on, we would do well to look into the long history of workers and their struggles for a slice of the American dream. That's why today I'm turning to historian Eric Loomis. He's an associate professor of history at the University of Rhode Island and an expert on U.S. labor history. He's the author of Empire of Timber, Labor Unions and the Pacific Northwest Forests, as well as Out of Sight, The Long and Disturbing Story of Corporations Outsourcing Catastrophe. His latest book is A History of America in Ten Strikes. In the course of our discussion, Eric Loomis discusses why the history of work and workers is central to U.S. history, how the onset of the Industrial Revolution created new conditions for the exploitation of workers, and as a consequence, the first strikes. Why we should think of the groundswell of self-emancipation of enslaved people during the Civil War as a general strike. Why laissez-faire is a myth, and how it obscures the fact that the role of the government in labor capital conflicts nearly always determines their outcome. How and why racism has been a persistent obstacle to workers of different racial and ethnic backgrounds uniting along class lines against their employers. Why workers in the Gilded Age believed in capitalism, but also believed that it had been rigged in favor of business over workers. How small but influential groups of socialists, anarchists, and communists within the labor movement have benefited workers, but also exposed the labor movement to persecution in the name of anti-communism. How federal policies and court decisions since the 1950s, especially Ronald Reagan's firing of 11,000 air traffic controllers in 1981, have dramatically weakened the American labor movement. And finally, what are we to make of recent labor actions, especially walkouts and strikes by teachers? Eric Loomis, welcome to In the Past Lane. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Well, your book covers 10 strikes and nearly 200 years of American history. And I think our listeners are probably wondering, what's the big idea that runs through all these moments of labor activism in history? What connects these 10 incidents, even though you talk about a lot more than just 10 strikes? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when we think about American history and we think about what ties it together, A lot of times in these days, we don't always think about labor and the experience of work as something that ties everything together. Mm -hmm. And I think work is one of those experiences, you know, maybe not exactly like food and air, but close to it that really Mm -hmm. unites us all. I mean, we all work or if we don't work, as is the case for too many people, we are sort of ostracized for that. It it becomes a shame. I mean, being unemployed is a shameful thing in our society. And so work or the lack of it or the experience of work is really a central theme for all of human history. And, you know, all human societies are organized in some form or another around the experience of work. And that is something, though, that's too often not thought about in our major themes of American history. And I think that, you know, Americans these days, obviously, it's a very divided nation. And I think that there are many people who want to hear a heroic stories of the American past that reaffirm the greatness of America or, or whatever. But there's also, I think, an unprecedented audience in the modern context for stories that don't always necessarily show the glories of America, but may in fact show some of the problems of America. And I think right. you see best-selling books by, say, Heather Thompson's book on Attica, which is a brutal, terrible story of the American past. And yet it was, you know, maybe the first academic history book in many decades to reach number one in the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. And so there, there is this, I think, desire by a lot of people today to think about America in terms of conflict. And, and I think that one thing that ties uh, this book together is the struggle for workers' rights and ties our, our history together. That work broadly conceived has been something that's heavily contested. And it's something that we continue to contest today. Oftentimes it has been violent. And I think that that violence is really a central part of the American past and in a present where conditions of work are getting harder again instead of easier. I think that understanding that past and understanding how we got here and and the challenges in which we face and when labor unions or workplace movements have done positive in the world or when they have sometimes been a negative force, I think these are all important things that we can learn as we try to understand where we fit in the broader scheme of America today. Right. I agree completely. I think there is that tendency among Americans to see the past as a very quiet, peaceful place where everybody got along. And in fact, most of American history is incredibly complicated, messy, and full of struggle and conflict. And examining 
labor history is certainly a great way to see that. And also to see that labor and work, as you point out, it's central to life, but it's also inextricably tied to democracy and politics. Right. I mean, you you don't really have a functioning democracy without the ability of workers to engage in workplace activity to promote their own rights. I mean, if you if you have a repression of worker rights, you really don't have that much of a democracy because you're locking out huge numbers of people who are fighting, yes, for their economic rights, but oftentimes issues of race and gender and sexuality also come into the workplace. And so these other broad issues around American democracy and American social movements that I think today get a lot of attention oftentimes are all also replicated or fought out in the workplace. And so by looking at our labor history, we're not just looking at a history of work. We're looking at histories of gender, histories of race and racism, histories of sexuality, histories of politics and democracy. So the workplace can become a site where all of American history is framed and it becomes a different kind of a mirror to look at these bigger questions of the American past and present. So why don't we start now with some of the material in your book and maybe start at the very beginning. The first chapter focuses on one of the first strikes in American industrial history, which is at Lowell, Massachusetts, and that's actually not very far from where we're sitting. So tell us about Lowell in that early 19th century period and how what happens in Lowell sort of maps the evolution of industrial capitalism. Right. And so... The Industrial Revolution in its modern form really begins in the 1790s with the opening of a factory in Pawtucket, Rhode Island by a man named Samuel Slater to produce textiles. And this is widely seen as the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You begin to have a factory system develop that grows and grows and will soon have thousands of people laboring in a single workplace to produce initially, again, textiles, but then any number of other products. Now, this has, of course, been happening in Britain going back several decades before, and in Britain, you know, what this had led to is a lot of very large cities that were also extremely nasty, where you had widespread pollution, political radicalism, and a lot of things that Americans, particularly somebody like Thomas Jefferson, openly fears. And so Americans, as this system develops, are trying to figure out how this can fit into its new, more democratic nation. And so in the 1820s, in what becomes Lowell, Massachusetts, a bunch of industrialists start an experimental town that will supervise young women under a system of industrial work, but that will also supposedly educate them, prepare them for marriage. And so these, you know, large mills are constructed and these young women who will become known as the Lowell Mill Girls are laboring in there, you know, 10 and 12 and 14 hours a day. And then after that, although I personally would just be exhausted, they are supposed to go to talks They produce newspapers and things like this, Uh, big speakers such as Ralph Waldo Emerson or Henry Wadsworth Longfellow or Henry David Thoreau come and they speak to them. And this becomes this kind of cultural flowering in America. But the conditions are, in fact, really bad. I mean, you know, they are working 14 hours a day. Those mills are tremendously hot. They're dangerous. You know, women's hair can get stuck in the machines and can be effectively scalped. It's pretty tough. And so these women, because they are farm women, Anglo-Saxon farm women, and they feel they have access to the levers of American democracy, they begin to protest. And so you really begin to see the first strikes in American history in the 1830s and 1840s are among the first strikes in American history around these issues. And they don't really win. They force the state of Massachusetts to investigate the conditions. And what really ends up happening is that that textile work, uh, it ends up becoming like those British cities such as Manchester, dirty, filthy, nasty. And those young women begin to be replaced by immigrants, first from Ireland and then from any other number of countries. But I think that what is significant about this, most importantly, I think, is that too often in the way we think about work and the way we think about labor activism in America, we really think about men. We think about men in factories, you know, in a kind of, if I ask my students, imagine a worker and what comes to your mind when you think of a worker, a lot of times it's sort of, you know, some variant, you know, a white guy in a factory in a union jacket, maybe with an out of fashion mustache. And in fact, women have been central to American work from the very beginning of the industrial revolution, central to the American labor movement. And too often that history is erased. And I think by focusing on women, you know, in the first strike in the book, it places women where they should be, which is absolutely central to all of American labor history. Yeah. And it sort of signals also that this new capitalist economy is going to be one that's going to be contested throughout. It is not a magical system. It's one that 
evolves, involves many decisions, many forms, and there are going to be people to, to contest it. Well, you mentioned that women have been often left out of labor history. So too have people of color. And so that your second chapter, when I first read of your book, my first immediate thought was, I wonder how slavery works its way in here. Because it's often so often left out or sidebar story to American history or to American labor history. But when one thinks of slaves or the enslaved as workers whose labor is what the whole system is based on, that actually changes the way we view it. So tell us about the second chapter set during the Civil War. Right. So people forget. We talk a decent amount about slavery in our society, but we usually frame it in terms of racism. And yes, obviously, slavery is a racist system. But the entire point of slavery is as a labor system. There is no reason for slavery if it's not about labor. And Southern planters demanded when they come to the new world, so-called, that people of color labor for them for free. That is central to the entire experience of American colonization from the English colonies of North America through the Spanish and French and British and Dutch and Portuguese colonies in what is today Latin America. And initially, this was intended uh, by and large to be native peoples working for free. That doesn't work out for a number of reasons, although there is plenty of native slavery. And what ends up happening is that fairly quickly you have these Europeans turning to Africa and the importation of around 10 to 11 million Africans as slaves between the years of about you know, the early 1500s until about 1850, most of that coming in the 18th century. So we cannot really look at slavery without thinking about it as work. But if we think about labor history and we don't center the experience of slavery, we simply are not understanding labor history. And yet slavery is so often left out of this narrative, in part because it doesn't necessarily fit Marx's thought about the relationship between industrialization and the state. But as many recent historians have explored in a series of just really amazing literature, slavery was central to American capitalism and global capitalism from the outset of that system. So what I focus on in this chapter two is how slaves during the Civil War basically engage in what the uh, great African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois labeled in his 1935 epic book, Black Reconstruction, as a, quote, slave general strike. That one by one, in an you know, unorganized but very consistent fashion, uh, slaves walk off the plantation during the Civil War, taking their labor with them, going to the North, and demanding protection from their owners by the American military. And what this really ends up doing is forcing the Lincoln administration to figure out what exactly we are going to do with this issue of slavery. Because when the Civil War starts, if we look at the country, and this is simplistic, it's four basic sections. Three of them know what the Civil War is about, right? You know, Southern whites know it's about slavery. Northern blacks know it's about slavery. Slaves sure know it's about slavery. Northern whites are the only people who aren't really sure. And these slaves fleeing to Union lines really force the issue. And, and it's really the success of this as a strategy and really undermining the Southern labor force, the ability of the South to continue to grow enough food to feed themselves, to feed their soldiers, to create munitions and things of this nature for the military effort. It becomes so effective uh, that uh, this is what really begins to spur Lincoln toward the Emancipation Proclamation. And so I think that, you know, Abraham Lincoln does engage in a brave political act when he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, but it was slaves themselves that forced the issue. And this is probably the single most significant labor action in all of American history, and yet it did not come as part of a union. It, didn't, it was not a particularly organized, and yet no labor action has made more of a difference in all of American history than the slave general strike during the Civil War. And the period following the Civil War, the period has many names, Reconstruction or Gilded Age or both, is another really important time period in terms of the evolution of industrial capitalism. And this is where we really start to see the what are recognizable as unions in name, but also in form and in some of the goals that they lay out. The Gilded Age, you know, roughly the end of the Civil War to the early, to about 1900, something on the order of 37,000 strikes. It's incredibly fraught and in many ways violent time period. What's important about this period? There's a series of strikes around the eight-hour day, but there's a lot more going on in this late 19th century period. And one of the things that starts to emerge 
is the question of what is the government's role in these conflicts? Is the government's role to stay on the sidelines and let labor and capital hash it out? Is it the role of the government to impose order, which would typically mean to side with capital? And how do workers try to reframe that, you know, come up with another option there that they think is more in line with the idea of democracy? Yeah. So, you know, the system of industrial capitalism really during the Civil War takes off and into a whole new direction. And, you know, America becomes a gigantic industrial power. In 1865, it's the world's fourth largest economy. In 1900, it's the world's largest economy. And this is the era where the truly huge factories develop a monopolies, the, the John D. Rockefellers, Andrew Carnegie's and J.P. Morgan's. And, you know, this is the period where you have massive immigration coming to the United States. Yeah fighting the workers for that industrial revolution. And, you know, in some ways, it's how modern America really begins to, to get off the ground. And when this system begins, you know, most here thinking particularly about white northern Americans, they mostly believe this system will work for them. They're pro-capitalist effectively, but it comes under the idea that ultimately uh, most people will control their own labor, that, that they will live in a society where the benefits of this capitalist system will be spread around fairly equally, where your ultimate goal as a uh, individual is to maybe be a farmer or an independent laborer or have your own little shop or, or things like this, but that ultimately your free labor will be the, the defining feature of your life. But in fact, the new economic system doesn't work that way. You have the growth of massive monopoly. You have the inability of people to control their own labor and uh, increasing desperation. And this is all reflected through incredibly unsafe workplace conditions, rampant income inequality, and the development of a political and court system that is going to openly side with the employer over the worker. And all of a sudden, Americans, uh, particularly, again, these white Northern Americans, feel very insecure. Um, this, the, the, the promises made to them by a capitalist system are shown to be lies, and they're trying to figure out what to do about it. And so they come up with a lot of sort of simplistic solutions because they ultimately believe in the system. But they just think something's off. And so, you know, you have all kinds of things, everything from, you know, Henry George's single tax on land to the ideas of Edward Bellamy to Chinese exclusion, that if we only get rid of the Chinese, then the system will balance itself out. And, and unfortunately, the first major piece of national legislation that comes directly out of the American labor movement is the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. So people are trying to figure out what is this one thing that's off? And this begins to evolve around the eight-hour day, um, which is a certainly a more productive conversation than getting rid of immigrants. And in 1886, by this time, a group called the Knights of Labor, which was an attempt at a first early national labor union that really brought most workers together although it really wasn't ready for what was going to happen, explodes, right? It, it, it goes from a tiny organization uh, to having hundreds of thousands of members by 1886. And the reason so many people are joining is because they see it as a vehicle to gain the eight-hour day. And in April and May of 1886, there are enormous strikes around the country demanding the eight-hour day. And unfortunately, because again, you know, people could use this group sort of for whatever they wanted, at Haymarket Square in Chicago in May of 1886, a group of anarchists get together and they hold a rally around the eight-hour day. And it's actually not even a very well-attended rally, but one anarchist, we're still not exactly sure who, throws a bomb at some cops and kills a bunch of them, about, about seven or eight. And this is going to lead to a widespread roundup of all the anarchists in Chicago, including the executions of several of them who almost certainly had nothing to do with it. And this gets associated with this broader eight-hour day movement, and that movement collapses and the Knights of Labor collapses. And so this is going to be one of many incidents uh, through the next 50 years where workers' attempts to uh, gain basic dignity are going to be crushed in a paroxysm of state violence. And I think that one of the big lessons of this book that I really want people to get across, and this I think is also segues into the next chapter, is that for all the talk about how can labor succeed, and there's a lot of dissension, particularly among leftists within the labor movement, that working with the Democratic Party has been a disaster for American labor. And we can argue about the effectiveness or not of that. But it is worth noting that there is absolutely no evidence in all of American history that strikes or a labor movement can succeed if government and business is united to crush it. 
Um, and that's something that I really emphasize over and over again, that the only really successful strikes of this Gilded Age are the rare attempts where government serves as a neutral agent. And I think that's a very, very important point for us to think about today as we're considering what a labor movement should look like and what its politics should be and what its electoral strategy should be. If you don't have friends in the federal or state governments, you have very, very little chance of success. Yeah, and that gets at a really important point, which is this myth of laissez-faire. You know, the laissez-faire is sort of the doctrine of the, of the Gilded Age and the idea that the government should be neutral, should be stay out of the way, let business run, do business. And if you just take a, a close look at things, the government is fully involved in the economy, fully involved in creating structures and, and laws and court decisions, sending in the military on behalf of capital in, in the late 19th century. So that – and this feeds into the workers' perception that the system is – fundamentally a good system, but it's corrupted, it's twisted, it's in the hands of monopolists and so forth. But I think the point that you were leading to, which is that the story of this period is not just that government sides with business, it's that there are exceptions. And in 1902, there's a really powerful exception involving Theodore Roosevelt and the United Mine Workers. So tell us about this kind of pivot point in the story of American labor. One point I want to make just before I get to that is that I, I think it's worth thinking about in terms of modern political rhetoric that the free market is – it doesn't exist. There, there's no such thing as a free market. It never has existed. A government choosing to, quote, stay out of a marketplace is a political decision. It's not a natural law like gravity. Right. And I think this is really important because that kind of rhetoric is still very powerful today. But the, in fact, you know, all these advocates of the free market in the modern sense are lobbying the government to get actively involved in promoting their agenda and promoting a pro-capitalist agenda, which is the opposite of a free market in reality. So I think I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah. I tend to bring that up fairly frequently. It comes up on this podcast, but also in my classes, I kind of provocatively ask students, Tell me about the free market and, you know, eventually circle around to that point. And many of them do think of capitalism as, as you say, like gravity or photosynthesis. It's just like something in nature. And it is not. It is our creation. It comes in hundreds of varieties and it's all predicated on decisions made by the state. Yeah, I mean, you know, capitalist propaganda is powerful. And it was powerful in 1900 and it's powerful in 2019. Mm -hmm. And it, this is something that too often does not get talked about enough, I think, by people who want to reform the system. But anyway, yeah, so it doesn't have to be this way, right? And there are moments where uh, during even in this Gilded Age where, in fact, workers are able to succeed. But the reasons that they're able to succeed, you know, for all the militancy and all of the strategy and all the organizing, ultimately the deciding factor is going to be the role of the government. Yep. And so Chapter 4 focuses on 1902 where you had a strike of coal miners in northeastern Pennsylvania – uh, against a series of railroads and coal mining companies that ultimately mostly went back to the capital as J.P. Morgan. He was the controlling interest in much of this. And these operators were, you know, I mean, the conditions in these coal mines were just horrific. I mean, people yeah. die all the time. The pay is abysmal. It's These are, you know, really, really, really awful jobs with no safety. And they have are trying to form a union. That's the United Mine Workers of America. And it was kind of, you know, going through some growing pains. It has a but in 1902, it has a fairly moderate leader named John Mitchell, a man who was a handsome man, who was very comfortable in talking to people in power. And so because of that and because he, he really had a moderate pose, when the union goes on strike in 1902, he is able to gain some pretty important allies. Now, he's helped in this by the fact that the East Coast heating market was basically one that was filled with coal from northeastern Pennsylvania, anthracite coal. Mm -hmm. And so as this strike goes toward the fall, people in power begin to be concerned about, you know, will everyday people in New York and Boston and Philadelphia be able to heat their, their homes in the winter? And Mitchell's had such a moderate attitude that he begins to gain an ally in President Theodore Roosevelt. And so Roosevelt calls in Mitchell and the mine workers and he calls in the coal operators. And Theodore Roosevelt is not pro-union by any stretch of the imagination. Roosevelt himself calls out uh, – uses the military to crush strikes he thinks are more radical. Roosevelt often has this kind of reformist popular idea of him as a reformist, but much of that is his own media creation and 
I have to call the Theodore Roosevelt the first 20th century American because he's maybe first 21st century Americans more accurate because yeah. he so uses the media to promote an agenda and feelings about him that and a actually, brand. Yes, a brand that, that remains very powerful today. Yep. The way people think about him is still a reflection of the way he was able to portray himself in the media back in the day. And in fact, he was a very conservative man in many, many ways. But Roosevelt did believe in ideas of fairness. And so when he calls in the mine workers and he calls in the coal operators, the coal operators are completely dismissive of the miners. And they treat the entire meeting with such little respect that it does the one thing you really do not want to do with Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> it makes him mad. Right. right. He feels personally insulted. And he had a very large ego. And himself, he was outraged. And so basically, he begins to threaten to nationalize the coal mines and to run the coal mines and to get that coal out under conditions that are going to be favorable to the workers. And he basically tells J.P. Morgan, you got to settle this thing. Yep. And what ends up happening is that it gets settled and there's a commission and the commission mostly rules in favor of the miners. They don't get union recognition, so it's not a long-term success, but they do get most of what else they ask for. But there's a famous incident in those meetings where they're interviewing the guy who is really the head of the coal miner and railroad operators, a man named George Bear. And Bear was one of Morgan's lieutenants, basically. And Bear actually says, and this is almost a direct quote, about these miners and the conditions in which they live. Quote, suffer? These men don't suffer. Why hell? Most don't even speak English. (laughs) And this really gets at the kind of attitude that employers had toward these workers. And of course, many of them were immigrants. And it shows just the sheer contempt that employers had toward workers. And the only way they're able to win here is because of the state and state interference. And the state is a neutral agent. And I, and I point out through that chapter other moments where, especially in the state governments, where uh, you do see major wins in the Gilded Age, but every single one of them is accompanied by a state for some reason or another being a neutral agent instead of on the side of the government. Right. And in that period, it's quite often that the you know, the opposite is true, that the state is intervening, uh, whether it's a state governor intervening or the the federal government. I mean, I saw there's been one study, it's sort of an ongoing study of how much violence occurred in this, you know, 1870, 1920 period. And the number, the stat was something where it's estimated somewhere between 500 and 800 Americans were killed in labor violence between 1870 and 1920. And the comparable figure in Great Britain is something like 18. The one in France is 12. So it's a degree of violence. Much of it brought about by the state is really an extraordinary thing, which makes Roosevelt's decision to use the might of the state on behalf of fairness, at least as a neutral figure in this dispute, all the more extraordinary. Well, and it's also worth noting here, you know, people often ask today, what, why is the U.S. does not have the same social welfare system and democracy levels as they do in Western Europe? And the, the answers to that are very complicated, but it's worth noting it goes back to this time. I mean, to go back to those statistics that you just cited, you know, if you go back to the 1880s, you can see where at that point American employers are making a decision to organize and go all out to crush unions at any cost at the same time that British and French employers are coming to terms with them. Mm -hmm. And that's an attitude that really continues all the way to the present. And so, you know, these questions about why America does not have a a robust social safety net, there are many answers to them. But in order to really understand this, we actually have to go deep into the American mythology about itself and deep into American history. It's not just something that happens because of politics in 1945 or 1990 or 2019 or whatever. Right. We do have powerful myths about, we already mentioned one about laissez-faire, the other is the overriding myth of individualism, which is not to say, and I always remind my students, myth doesn't mean it's false. It means that it's just misrepresented. It's exaggerated, leaves out key details. Well, we can pick up on that in a moment, but one thing I don't want to overlook is one of the central themes in the book is how workers strive towards solidarity and often fail, and they often fail when it comes to race, that race becomes this great rocky outcropping that they crash on all the time. Tell us how this works and why workers who have shared class interests very often turn on each other and fail to unite and therefore lose their cause on the basis of race. This is critical. You know, there are two major lessons in this book that I really want readers to get. One is this thing about the government we've been talking about. And the second is the role of race. And it's too often you hear this question be asked of white Republican voters. Quote, why aren't they voting for their interests? Right. And that question drives me crazy because they are voting for their interests. 
They're voting for their white interests. Exactly. They're, they're voting for their evangelical interests. Mm -hmm. They're voting for their anti-abortion interests. They're voting for their misogynist interests. In, in other words, all of us are made up of a series of interests, right? We all are complicated figures that are shaped as individuals by, yes, our class and how we grew up, but also our race, our gender, our religion, our personal experiences, and our education and everything else. And each of them is add to the totality of what we as humans are. And those interests do not always align, right? And so unfortunately, a critical theme of American labor history and American history at large is that white workers have consistently, not always, but consistently chosen their interests of white solidarity over their interests of class solidarity. That is absolutely critical to understanding much about American history. It goes very far to understand why labor unions were so unsuccessful in organizing the South. Yep, yep. It goes very far to understanding why, you know, white union members are uh, inclined to vote for somebody like Donald Trump at much, much higher rates than black or Latino union members. It goes very far to understand why say, uh, white workers would riot in the middle of World War II because of the promotion of black workers, even though everybody's supposedly trying to defeat the Nazis. That's right. We see this over and over and over again in American history, and there is no way to understand American labor history without understanding the centrality of race. Too often in our political rhetoric today, particularly on the left, where I follow closely and participate in, there is a lot of attempts to prioritize class over race as a uniting feature that we all have class interests and that over discussion of, quote, identity politics is it will be often be portrayed as a negative thing that divides us by class. But that's bogus. Mm -hmm. In fact, class is an identity as well. And secondly, to prioritize the idea of uniting by class over race basically trivializes the interests of black and Latino workers. It erases the fact that in their experience as humans, being black and Latino probably means more in determining their everyday existence than their experience as a working class individual. And at the same time, it, it has an unfortunate tendency to excuse the racism of the white working class. If we're really going to get serious about this, about dealing with this, we have to face racism full on. And I think this is one of the reasons why, I, again, to, to mention something I mentioned before, constantly point out that this issue of the Chinese Exclusion Act being the first act, yep. the first major national law coming out of the labor movement, you know, and it's why I focus heavily throughout the book on the ways that American workers allow themselves to be divided by race. And racism is not some conspiracy coming from the top. It's not something foisted upon us by employers. White people are more than happy to be racist all on their own without employers helping them. doesn't mean employers aren't going to take advantage of yes, it. Yes, so they will certainly take advantage, but it's there. They're taking advantage of a pre-existing set of ideas. Yes. Well, one of the other things that is important, particularly in the 20th century, although it's there in the late 19th century, is the specter of, of communism and socialism. And, you know, we have a series of red scares that always seem to knock labor back. Tell us more about that and pick whatever spot you want, whether it's 1919, 1946, any other point there where this labor unions, one way that they're demonized, which you just mentioned, which is that they're demonized for promoting civil rights, and that certainly plays well in the South, but they're also demonized as agents of, of socialism and, and communism and maybe even working on behalf of the Soviet Union. Right. So – as these responses develop to capitalism, you know, then we, we talked about going up through the eight-hour day. The way that you really begin to see a more sophisticated worker response to the realities of what capitalism is really like was socialism. And socialism develops as a wide variety of possible outcomes uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Right. And then after 1917, most of these forms of socialism become out of fashion except for communism because of the success of communism in the Soviet Union. That becomes the major uh, form of socialism in the United States in the decades after that. So – a lot of these labor unionists that develop, particularly radical ones, will be communists. You will have many, many communists in the labor movement. 
the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Workers, which organizes the United Auto Workers, the United Steel Workers, the United Rubber Workers, these enormous industrial unions that really do bring workplace democracy to the United States in the 1930s and 1940s for the first time, are, are largely, although not exclusively, organized by communist organizers. These people were great, great organizers yeah. by and large. They're well trained. The Soviet Union has invested in them. You, you have a lot of workers since the 1930s, right? It's the Great Depression. Things are bad. You know, capitalism seems to have failed. Yep. Um, certainly in Europe, a lot of, you know, people are moving to either fascism or communism, feeling that capitalism is a dead letter, a failed system, and, and that our choices are one or the other. And the United States, due to its, you know, individualistic, more pro-capitalist mentality, doesn't quite go to those levels of extremes, but there are – there is great interest in both fascism and in communism in the United States in the 30s. And as you have you know, enormous unemployment during the Great Depression, up to 25 percent unemployed and around another 25 percent underemployed in 1933, you know, a lot of people also feel capitalism has failed and they're listening to these messages by communist organizers and they find them appealing. Mm. And these communist organizers do a tremendous job of bringing people into unions. Some of the unions will be openly communist. Others will have communists within them but will not really be very communist in reality and many will be divided between communists and and anti-communist. And in some extent, these communist workers do undermine themselves by changing their position on things whenever uh, the Soviet Union demands it. And workers can see through the hypocrisy that frankly did exist there. So there will be large-scale red baiting by both employers and the government, first in 1919 and 1920 in the first Red Scare, and then after World War II in 19, you know, 1946 until the 50s in the second Red Scare. And, you know, in both of these scenarios, you will see widespread violations of civil rights. Uh, communists will be kicked out of the labor movement in 1947 and 1948, much to the detriment of that labor movement ultimately. But it's worth noting that the seeds of this were already existing, that uh, Americans have so little tolerance for radicalism. If, if you go back even to the first attempts to organize on a broad scale, say in the 1870s, you know, in 1874, for instance, there's a economic depression called the Panic of 1873, and some unemployed workers are gathering in New York City with a very simple demand. They want to, they want to go march to the mayor's house in New York City and demand a public jobs program. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really all they want. It's called, and this is going to be called the Tompkins Square riot. So they're going to gather in Tompkins Square, and the police basically come at them with horses and beat them to a pulp. Yep. And this is widely rejoiced in the media using overheated rhetoric to say that these unemployed workers and their movement are bringing revolution to America. Only one it was a job. Right. And so the American media was always ready and the American employers were always ready to bust any kind of radicalism. And, and this is an unfortunate reality of our, of our American past as well. And as you say, this carries forward from the 1870s into the mid 20th century at least. And it's even still residual elements of that in our popular rhetoric today. Well, we do want to move a little bit further towards the present day. You know, if we take a marker of the mid-1950s, there's a lot going on, but it's the highest level of unionization. That's where – you and I see – you see different numbers, 30, 40 percent, depending on how you – but a very large chunk of the American workforce are in unions. And that's coincidentally also the – you know, that period, that post-war period is where we are our most productive economically and also our least unequal, if that is a way of phrasing it, the, that inequality shrinks quite dramatically in opportunity, whether that's going to college, owning a home earning a, a reasonable middle-class wage as a, as a factory worker in Detroit, say, that's when all of that is, is very, very evident. And it's also at that moment, that's also the marker of when unionization begins to decline, kind of culminating in 1980. So tell us about that connection between prosperity, equality, and productivity in the mid-1950s, and then the ways in which that was chipped away at. And there were other factors going on as well. Yeah. Basically, you know, in the Great Depression, the, the Roosevelt administration, particularly as we go into World War II, the big transformation there is that conditions got so desperate that the government decides that it is going to enact a labor law that is going to actually allow unions to succeed. And that is epitomized in the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, which forces collective bargaining system on recalcitrant employers, and then the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 that creates the minimum wage, the eight-hour day, overtime pay, et cetera. 
This was not universal. Workers of color are largely excluded, but nonetheless, it significantly moves the ball forward for labor rights. And then in World War II, what the government does is it basically forces employers to agree to unions um, in order to uh, stop labor strife from getting in the way of war production. And Mm -hmm. so in this case, what the government's really doing is ensuring the future of the American labor movement. So the labor movement comes out of World War II with unprecedented access, connections to the Democratic Party access to the halls of power, union contracts, and fairly flush funds. And in that post-war period where the economy is booming, unions are able to negotiate unforeseen things, not only you know higher wages, but, but also uh, benefit packages, medical plans, vacation pay, these sorts of things that really do create the middle class and combine that with the government that is engaging in unprecedented attempts to sort of ensure that economic prosperity continues here thinking of things like the GI Bill or the Federal Housing Administration or all of these other you know the, all these other acts that are passed you have the creation in the 1950s and into the 1960s of again what what today we think of as the middle class or where you know somebody might have a Polish last name and their parents had come over in the United to the United States in 19 you know 15 in tremendous poverty and by 1955 their son is you know driving you know a Buick and owns a home and living in the suburbs. Yep. Now, again, this is not always uh, or often extended to black workers, but 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 still, conditions for black workers are also improving during these years. Now, to some extent, this there was unique circumstances here, which is basically that you know Europe right. had destroyed itself, and the U.S. does not really have a lot of competition. And, you know, and the U.S. is also rebuilding Japan at this time, and that's happening through, you know, by and large American labor. And so, yes, there are some unique conditions here that can't be hand-waved away. However, you know, what ends up happening by the 1960s is that you begin to see these unions already in decline. And there are a number of reasons for that. One goes back to this issue of race, that the inability of the labor movement to organize the South, where – when they do attempt to, and there are major attempts in the late 1940s to do that, the most effective union busting technique is by associating unions yep. with civil rights. And Southern white workers are more than happy to connect unions, communism, anti Semitism, and civil rights all in a package of foreign has come to destroy our system of life. And so while black workers in the South are, are really quite willing to join unions, white workers, in 1946 and for that matter in 2019 are extremely resistant to unionization based on these racial appeals. And and this is something that we saw very powerfully in 2014 when there is an attempt by the United Auto Workers to organize the Mm -hmm. Volkswagen plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And even though Volkswagen itself wanted it organized, a outside effort connects unions to black people and in particular to the city of Detroit and the white workers vote it down and it it fails. Right. And that campaign was funded by conservatives and business interests that really painted this bleak picture of unions equal black people equal desolation and, you know, with vivid images of, of what happened to Detroit as though what happened to Detroit was done by the United Auto Workers and not many, many other factors. Right, right. I mean, you know, Detroit itself is a complicated place. Um, um, and, you know, but the idea that, that unions led to the destruction of Detroit is, is, is an absurd myth, yet one that is rather powerful. And so what ends up happening is because a lot of these uh, unionized factories begin to realize they can just move to the south. Yeah. Right. And so they begin to close their union shops in the north. They move to the south. And then especially after 1965, they start moving to Mexico. Yeah. Thanks to the border industrialization program, which was an incentive of, to attract American unionized firms across the border for cheap wages, something that the American government will you know, participate in actively as a way to build up their allies, first with Mexico, but then with uh, nations around the world. And so widespread capital mobility really begins to undermine unionization, again, first moving to the South and then moving overseas. And that's really what begins to uh, seriously undermine the labor movement. The labor movement screws up on its own, gets more interested in supporting, you know, killing communists in Vietnam right. than it does in organizing the unorganized workers of the United States. So certainly the era where uh, people such as George Meany and Lane Kirkland were the head of the American labor movement is a pretty dark period and a period of wasted opportunities. But we can't overlook the larger structural issues at play here. What is different, though, in the 1970s is the rise of public sector unionization. Right. Teachers and... Right. Teachers, 
other kinds of government workers, air traffic controllers, postal workers. You have a widespread unionization effort there in the 1970s, and that leads to a kind of revival of the labor movement during those years. And a lot of these workers are engaging in what are frankly illegal strikes, that they are going on strike as government workers, which is technically illegal. But they're getting away with it, and they're getting away with it in part because the public is sympathetic to their plight, in part because they are well-organized and militant, and in part because the federal government doesn't know what to do. And so you have an amazing postal worker strike out of New York, especially in 1970. And and postal workers, we don't think of postal workers as as having rough jobs, but in fact, the conditions in these post offices were awful. Mm -hmm. And they definitely deserved uh, much better conditions, and they have to win it through a strike, and the Nixon administration caves. And this begins to embolden other unions, other public sector unions to organize. And, And one of those is the air traffic controllers. Mm-hmm. And they engage in a number of pretty radical actions that are – it's a very democratic union. It's a very militant union. It's also a union that didn't really care very much about how they were seen in the public, including by other unions. And so they're engaging in, in acts such as slowdowns and other uh, actions that are intended to gain the wage and hour and retirement and benefit increases they are demanding – much of which were justified. Being an air traffic controller was a really stressful job. Right. The government underfunded all the Federal Aviation Administration, and you had a lot more uh, airplane accidents back in the 70s than you do today because of this underfunding. And so, you know, and, and those those accidents, they're on the, the, the brains and the hearts and the souls of these air traffic controllers, you know, so they, they actually had it pretty rough. But their actions also created increasing anger of the American public who are finding their flights delayed, yep. things like this, and angering other unions that are receiving the wrath of this. And in 1981, they decided to go on a radical action, even though they had, in fact, endorsed Ronald Reagan for the presidency. That's right. Because these were – most of these air traffic controllers were conservative white men out of the military. And while they were democratic and militant, they were also racist and sexist. So they were very – and they hated Jimmy Carter because he hadn't negotiated with them. So they decided to endorse Reagan. And then they go on strike uh, in 1981, thinking that Reagan will support them because they had endorsed them. Reagan sees the strike as illegal, which is is, and he fires them all. Right. And that moment, really the greatest disaster in American labor history, basically ends the period of the 70s militants of the labor movement, ends the era of public sector strikes, and really begins the modern era of union busting. Including the private sector. Yeah, absolutely. Because what happens when he busts them in 81 is that now it's a message to the private sector that these union contracts you've had for 40 or 50 years, you don't have to respect them anymore. So in 1983, Phelps Dodge, which is the world's largest mining company, shuts its mine down in Arizona where it had a union contract going back into the 40s and reopens it without a union, leading to one of the big strikes of the era. So that's a, a real tipping point in terms of you can see it draw a straight line, downward slope on the graph of the numbers of people in unions from 1981 to the present day. So where are we now? I always ask historians whose books we talk about on the podcast about what's relevant now. And it's pretty obvious that there's a lot that's relevant in your work. Well, in some ways, it's a very grim time. You know, like the Gilded Age, the first Gilded Age, today you now have a Supreme Court that is simply making up doctrine to bust labor unions. And so, you know, in the late 19th century, you had the court of, of Melville Fuller, the, probably the worst Supreme Court justice in all of American history, who is most famous for the Plessy versus Ferguson decision that created Jim Crow or legalized Jim Crow, but was engaged in dozens of other decisions during his era that were racist, but that also basically create a new doctrine you know, rewrote laws to take away from the actual intent of that law and to use them to bust labor unions. Right. And you're really seeing the same thing today in the modern court. The Janus decision, Janus versus AFSCME in 2018, created a public sector right to work in the United States, creating effectively free speech restraints on unions that don't exist anywhere else in American society. And we're going to expect to see more and more and more of this, that the Supreme Court is simply going to rule against unions based on the constitutional principle of Republicans don't like unions. Right. I mean, there was a moment in oral arguments for Janus where Anthony Kennedy goes on this kind of rampage about how he thinks public sector unions are bad because they cost taxpayers too much money. Well, look, Mm. we could argue the merits of that. Right. What that has to do with the Constitution is completely unknown to me. It was just Kennedy ruling in favor of his own political preferences. And that's what you're seeing. So it's very grim. And we cannot underestimate that. At the same time, also a little bit like the original Gilded Age, you have a lot of Americans who believed in the promises of capitalism that have been presented to them in the post-war period in this case, but their real lives do not reflect that. Mm -hmm. 
their real lives reflect great economic struggles. You know, here today we hear that, you know, we have very low unemployment. The economy is doing great. But those unemployment numbers don't tell us that much. They don't tell us how many people are having to work not one job but three. They're not telling us how many people uh, don't have sick leave. They're not telling us how many people don't have the ability to put their children in daycare, how many people are underemployed, how many people are struggling with health care debt, how many people cannot do what they want to do in their jobs because or in their lives because they have student loan debt. And the economy is not working for a whole lot of people. And I think that as the Supreme Court and particularly Republican politicians seek to eviscerate what's left of the American labor movement, what they're also doing is unleashing the power of workers. One thing that the union structure did is it channeled worker discontent into a series of legal processes, such as the National Labor Relations Board. You take all that away and worker discontent could pop up in any number of ways. And, you know, you're seeing it right now with these teacher strikes. One reason that these teacher strikes have been fairly successful and have gotten a lot of sympathy from West Virginia to Los Angeles and going back to Chicago in 2012, the Chicago Teachers Union, and the role teachers played in the fight against Scott Walker in Wisconsin in 2011 is that these teachers are very respected members of our community, and yet they're treated as poorly as any other worker. And so, you know, they're able to gain a lot of public sympathy because they're not only fighting for better wages and better hours, but they're fighting for the future of public education, right? That their position is reflected in the reality that public education is under attack from charter schools. It's under attack from anti-tax people. It's under attack from states that do not wish to fund it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, so what are these teachers striking about? Wages is a very small part of it. They're almost together on wages. They're like a half a percentage point apart. The issues are smaller class sizes Mm -hmm. and actually having nurses in the schools. And, you know, for any of you, you've been around six-year-olds, they're walking germ factories. The idea that you wouldn't have a nurse in a school is really outrageous. And And same with librarians. In fact, libraries are not really libraries anymore. They're places of books, but also digital learning and all the things that are going to be part of the 21st century economy. And many schools simply don't have librarians. That's right. And so they're fighting for the future of public education. And because of that, they're tapping into widespread community support. And I think that, you know, we're in a scenario today where most Americans do not feel comfortable with their position in the economy. This fuels the 2016 campaigns of both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And I think, you know, it it certainly has not improved since. I mean, Donald Trump told lies about American populism and, and everything he's ever done has been for the elite, by the elite. And, you know, his message to workers are lies, but nonetheless, they were still messages to workers that gave for some, at least white workers who were also invested in his racism, a chance to believe that somebody was going to be working for them for once. And Right. And bringing jobs back yeah, from overseas right, which and many is never other unrealistic happen. possibilities. Right, right. That's not going to happen. I mean, if the jobs came back, they would be automated. But uh, nonetheless, this kind of economic discontent is very real. Yeah, it is. And it's coming up in the most obvious form in strikes, but also even just the response to the Amazon opening a new headquarters in, in New York. There's a groundswell of opposition to it by progressive groups that see it as not an opportunity for jobs and 21st century economy, but really something that's going to undermine. It's going to employ very few people. It's gotten massive tax breaks to show up. And the same thing with Foxconn in Wisconsin. And so there seems to be a lot of a lot more discontent and a lot more mobilization against these kinds of policies. So where it takes us is is anybody's guess. Yeah, I mean, I think what's happening in part is that right now the power structure in America, certainly Republican power structure, which has always been basically pro-corporate, but generations of the Democratic power structure coming out of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s are fundamentally pro-corporate. And so you have somebody like, you know, the New York power structure, like Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio, both trying to get Amazon. And yet I think there's a lot of These politicians who simply do not understand the level of discontent and outrage over policies that move money into the pockets of the rich. And these grassroots swell that you're starting to see now a significant block of Congress subscribe to in the elections of people such as, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Ayanna Presley here in Massachusetts, both of which won primary elections against, you know, reliable Democrats, but Democrats who were seen as being favorable to, to corporations. There's a really is a great deal of discontent about this. And, and I think that, you know, I don't know what it's going to lead to. I don't know if it'll lead to a, a transformation of the Democratic Party or it fizzles out. But I do think you are seeing that finally begin to appear in the political discourse. 
And I think there's, there's a whole generation of leaders on the Democratic side that really don't know what to do with it. And of course, Republican leaders are just dismissive of it entirely. So the future around inequality and labor activism broadly defined because our future labor activism may happen outside of unions, not inside of a traditional unions. Mm -hmm. It remains unknown. But I think the one thing that we can say is that within unions or without unions, workers will stand up for whatever they think is right based upon whatever tactics they have at hand. And so you can crush unions, but you'll never crush the struggle of workers for dignity. All right. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Well, Eric, this has been a really fascinating conversation, one that's extremely relevant to our time. So thanks so much for talking to us at In the Past Lane. I really appreciate you having me. Eric Loomis is the author of A History of America in 10 Strikes published by The New Press and available everywhere that books are sold. You can follow Eric on Twitter at Eric Loomis, E-R-I-K-L-O-O-M-I-S. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, I've got an idea that's really going to streamline our production. Stay in your lane, dude. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 